and let's get started. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Da, 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 da. There we go. So if you, if you don't know, um, thanks everybody for coming. My name is Ken Rosenthal and I'm a uh, park naturalist here at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about using iNaturalist and how it, you can use it um, regularly, but also uh, what's significant uh, this weekend with iNaturalist. Um, and we'll go from there. So um, iNaturalist is a, it's a um, way of uh, posting up pictures uh, or sound uh, onto a network where other people can chime in and help you um, identify what you're looking at. So it's a, good, it's a good way to get identification and kind of crowdsourcing it. Um, it's a nice way to connect with other people. It's also a good way to see what's being seen in your area. Um, and it's a good citizen science tool. Uh, and so I'm going to go through all that. Um, I really enjoy it because I got in, I got into this. I was using bug guide, which is really good for bugs. Obviously, it's really good for insects and some arthropods like um, uh, spiders, millipedes, centipedes, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's limited to that. And there were so many other things that I wanted to know what I was seeing and taking pictures of. Um, and so iNaturalist has really been good for that. Um, it does have its limitations, but it's it's really if you want to know what something is, it should be your first stop uh, if you're not interested in cracking open a field guide. Um, this picture here on my opening page is a a uh, wandering broadhead planarian, if I'm remembering that correctly. And it's actually an invasive flatworm that preys on earthworms. Uh, and when I saw it and took a picture, I had no clue what it was. And I thought maybe it was some kind of slug. Um, and so I was really excited to discover something completely new I'd never seen before. Um, and also then share with our natural resource manager that um, these guys are in the area, which you probably already knew, and there's probably a lot of them, but uh, it was still um, something completely brand new for me. And it's one of the things I really enjoy. Uh, about iNaturalist. It's really easy to find iNaturalist. It's iNaturalist.org. Uh, it's pretty quick and easy to set up an account. I think all they ask for is an email address and a password. I don't know if they uh, even ask for anything else. An email address, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a username uh, and a password. Uh, so you can log in or sign up there. Uh, and then it also has apps for uh, Android and iPhones so that you can um, carry that around and link that up with your account and do that wherever you are. Um, so here's a snake. I found a snake. Great. I got a nice story. I can tell my friends I found a snake. Here's a picture. I can send it to them and you now everybody's happy. But if I have an application like iNaturalist, I can take this picture of a snake, post it on, on iNaturalist with information about when and where it was found. And now it's a piece of data for anybody who's looking for um, what snakes are in the area, when snakes are being seen in the area. This one is, is definitely a first year. Um, we've had a ringneck snake who is, um, I think she's got somewhere next to the nature center she thinks is a great place to lay eggs. And every year we find these in our basement, at least every year I've been here. Um, but it's a great way for people to see not only is a snake in the area, but they're also breeding because they're so tiny. So I can take this piece of data that was just a picture in my collection, upload it to iNaturalist, uh, and now we've got a, um, piece of data for somebody. You can see there's evidence, uh, the evidence being the photo of the snake. There is the name of the organism. There is, I'm, I just realized I can move my mouse. I'm pointing like you can see that. So there's the name of the organism. There is when it was uh, observed, the data was seen, and then the location and whoops, this isn't the actual, um, it's the actual site and you can zoom in to get a closer look at where that blue data point is actually showing it's uh, it's it, this is at uh, Gulf Branch Nature Center. Um, now you can also add it to projects. The. Let's see. This project never home alone and Virginia biodiversity. I had to add it to manually. This project auto, uh, global reptile blitz automatically um, nabs every reptile that shows up around the world and includes it in that project. And then um, the biodiversity in Gulf Branch and Glebe Road Park is when I set up uh, with boundaries. So anything within the boundaries of the park automatically shows up in that project. So we know what's being seen and when, uh, and to some extent where uh, within the park. And then the next piece on this is they are, they assess the data quality. I, I don't do much with this, but I want to show this to everybody. Um, when you put the piece of data up there and you take a guess at it, let's say you may or may not be correct, but you have a um, 
you have a critter and in this case I knew what the species was, but maybe you have one that you don't. So you just like I know this is a spider. I'm going to at least classify it as a spider. As you get identifications from other people, it moves from needs ID to cat to it can be um, I think casuals when there isn't any evidence, but it can move from needs ID to research grade. You can see there's three checks here. If you have two people that agree on the idea of your organism, you have a research grade. Um, a uh, research grade observation and once it's research grade it goes to the global biodiversity information facility and i'll talk more about that in a second um so any research grade uh, observation on iNaturalist is a, is uh, uploaded to gbif and then is available as free data for any researcher that's trying to find um, this kind of information um so you can see on um the side here this uh list of things here. The date was specified, the location, there is a photo, um, ID was supported by at least two people, and then um, more accuracy is the date accurate, the location accurate. Uh, is the organism wild? You can put in, you could take a picture of something that's being grown in a garden and put it cultivated. I don't know how valuable that is. Um, I don't typically do that, but if you do take a picture of something that is domestic, uh, it is a pattern that is that um, Please go ahead and um, make sure you mark it as such. Um, and then the evidence of the organism, again, the picture or the, the sound, uh, is it recent? And then is it at species level or lower? Meaning, did you get it down that down to the species level? Some uh, Sometimes when you take a picture or sound, you may not be able to get past the genus level. Um, if you think of uh, our scientific name which is homo sapiens homo is the genus level species level is sapiens if you don't get it to species level it's usually not research grade um or and usable for this this um for the gbif and this again here's the global biodiversity information facility gbif.org and you can see you know they have over you know close to a billion and a half occurrence records 52,000 data sets i could data sets i could read the numbers off it's, a, it's a probably I think it's a pretty valuable treasure trove for certain researchers where they can get essentially free uh, and open access to biodiversity data, which is what it says, you know, and this is something that you can contribute to every time you put an observation up on iNaturalist. So speaking of putting an observation on iNaturalist, because I'm the king of segues, what is an observation? Um, there's five key pieces to an observation on iNaturalist. Who you are meaning the person that made the observation, the minute you sign in to your iNaturalist account, if you're if you're using a desktop computer and doing this online, or if you're um, using the app on your phone, that piece, of, that piece of the data is already checked because you've logged in so they know who you are. Then you have, you know, you've got where, what you saw, oh, my mouse here, what you saw, where you saw it, and when you saw it, and the evidence of what you saw. Typically, again, this is a photo or a sound. You can put up, hey, I saw a robin today, uh, and here's the location, here's the date and the time. But without evidence, somebody else can't agree with you. Somebody else can't uh, make an identification to corroborate that. Um, and so it's going to be a casual um, observation. That's if you, you know, if you're really into your list and keeping it there and you're like, I, I saw that Robin. I don't know when I'm going to see a Robin again, so I want to make sure it's on my list. So I remember I saw it and it's part of my species list. That's great. Just know that it's not going to be a part of that bigger uh, citizen science uh, piece without the evidence. So the evidence is right here. But if you have, you know, a digital camera, excuse me, or you take that um, picture with your um, cell phone, You've also already automatically already have the when you've got the date and the time because that's part of the metadata of the photograph. And if you have, I have location services enabled on my phone uh, when I take pictures, um, and so I've automatically got the where as well. I wish I had that on my my um, my digital camera, uh, but I don't. But I got a zoom lens on my digital camera, so I use that a lot also. Uh, and so then it really also with many of these things already checked for you. Typically, you know, when you have that picture, you're just kind of making sure you've got where you saw it and what you saw. So we're going to go through um, an observation that I put up uh, earlier today. This is a uh, well, we'll find out what this is. This is an insect um, uh, and it was pretty exciting because he was cool out the other day and he was trying to bask in the sun and get some warmth on. And this is not one that sits still by any means. So I was pretty excited to get these pictures. So I've got my picture 
and I have taken it off my camera card and put it on my on my um, uh, computer. I do a lot on the desktop because again, I have the digital camera. Um, if I take pictures with my cell phone that I'm going to use for iNaturalist, I run them through the iNaturalist app first uh, before I take them off my cell phone. So I do it that way because you do lose the metadata. I, I found that I don't always have the metadata um, as good when I transfer it to the desktop than if I do it first on my um, on my phone. So I always do that. But this again was taken with my digital camera. So I got the picture. Uh, it's on my computer, so I'm going to upload it to iNaturalist. So how would I do that? How would I do that? OK, let's. Uh, oops. Interesting. My cursors aren't working anymore. So. Here is. Um, uh, I've logged in and this is my uh, dashboard. So here's the recent activity for things that I've either added identification to or put up myself. Um, we're going to I'm going to go to. Upload. Uh, and it's a click on that. It's going to give me the opportunity to choose files to drag and drop. Uh, for this one, I just did one photo and it pops up right there. And you can see it's already populated the date and the time here. So now I just have to add the location because again, I don't have a GPS on my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on my camera and I have to supply the species name. I will say this. Um, the reason I have the location services on my phone is because when you click on location, it's going to give you a map of the entire world and you have to zoom all the way in to that little backyard or that little stream or that little park or whatever, and it can be tedious. Um, so I do avoid that by keeping the location services on my phone active for my uh, camera. Um, when I do it on the desktop like this, if I have other pictures from that same park, I will upload them as well. So then you'll see another box here and here and here and here and here uh, and maybe more rows down here. And then once I've I've zoomed in on the place once when I go to the next record, it automatically goes to where that last record was marked. So it's much easier from there on to maneuver about that area to put all my pictures in. So I do try to do them in groups like that when I've you know taken multiple pictures at one site. Um, the other thing you can do is if you take more than one picture and I'll talk later about why that's important. If you take more than one picture of an organism. You know there's one here and here and all three of these are the same critter. You can take each of these squares and move it on to the first one. Um, and that will then give you one observation, but you've got three pictures. They used to have a limit of four pictures. I don't think there's a limit anymore. Um, but there's no reason to put like 45 pictures if two or three are, are going to get you what you need. Um, you know, because I know I think they're constantly looking for for more space. They haven't enabled us to put video up yet, which is would be a, a is a bummer because you know you can get some stuff that you can't always get with a camera. But um, I've digressed enough, so let's get back to the uh, to the uh, um, the observation here. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on that because you know we've got all this empty space here we don't really need. So here is our our um, piece of uh, evidence. Like I said, the metadata for the date and time is already done in there. So we want to add the species name and the location. The most exciting thing for me about iNaturalist is when you click on the species name, iNaturalist has millions of observations and they have a an algorithm. I want to think it might even be artificial intelligence, uh, some like small amount of artificial intelligence that looks at your picture and compares it with all the other pictures they have and tries to give you an identification, which is great. Um, what's interesting is um, last time I did this, it was a gray squirrel picture. So the first uh, the first top mm -hmm. species suggestion was a gray squirrel. And that was great. This is a hummingbird clearing and it's actually the fifth one down here. So don't always assume a that the first one is the best one. And B, don't always assume that it knows what it's talking about, because there have been times too where I've put up a picture and it's been completely off or whatever the um, algorithm is focusing on in the picture is not what you actually want it to see. Um, so do use your um, use your own powers of deduction uh, when doing this as well. Don't blindly trust this. Uh, it's really amazing. It's really good. Um, I put up feathers. I put up scat and it's amazing that it'll pick up 
on that and, and, and give you a pretty good identification. It's also only as good as what you find. If you find something that only three other people have been put have put up on a naturalist, it may not get you to that because there aren't as many um, pictures of it. But again, there's tons of you know, white-tailed deer and raccoon and red fox and things like that. So it should get you those pretty quick. So I'm going to select hummingbird clear wing. So now here, my observation has the evidence. Again, it's already got me because I'm logged in. It's got what it is, when I saw it, and where I saw it. So it's got the what, the when, and the where. Everything you need is here. You could go ahead and submit it. Like I said, I, I'm a numbers guy. I really enjoy birding and I really enjoy iNaturals because I enjoy seeing, you know, listing and, and numbers. So I like to use projects a lot. Whenever I have, I find a project that's interesting, I join it and then um, I like to add to it. So I actually, I actually um, will go ahead, went ahead and added this. So I clicked on projects so that the triangle is pointing to the right instead of down um, and it automatically populates this box with options for the projects that I've joined. Some of the projects I join are uh, fill automatically, like the Gulf Branch and uh, Old Glebe project fills automatically. So if you're within the boundary box, automatically goes in that project and you can't add to it. Um, there's a couple here for, there's my mouse, there's a couple here for Arlington Parks because I haven't, they don't have boundary boxes yet. Um, and they're um, in the old City Nature Challenge, 2017 you had to add it in uh i think manually but you don't anymore so some of these other ones are like that as well um but not all projects are like that so i'm going to go ahead and i've added it to the virginia biodiversity project which is funny because if it's virginia biodiversity all you should have to do is the bounding box for the state of virginia i don't know why they haven't done that yet but it's okay i enjoy doing it, it gives me something to do um so i've added this to the one project that i know it fits into i've got all my information there um, if, if we were to go back out all the way over to the right on the screen would be a green box that says submit one observation. If you had 37 observations, it would say submit 37 observations. You click on that box and it will upload. And then it'll take you to your observations. And there's my hummingbird clear wing observation, which you can see I added today. It was from last Thursday, but I added uh, this evening. And now it's a part of my... Um, my list and it's just waiting for someone to corroborate uh, what I have or tell me I'm incorrect uh, and give me something new. Don't be bashful about putting an identification on there because if it's incorrect, most people are very nice. I haven't had anybody. I saw one person flamed once for an identification and I intervened and said something in the comments and it turned out that they were both friends and one was just giving the other guy a hard time and um, I totally misread the situation. It's a very friendly community. Uh, and sometimes if you, you know, if you ask somebody be like, well, this is what I saw and that's why it's this species instead of this. So um, I've really enjoyed what I've learned from uh, being on here. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. We, ha we have a question really quick. Um, sure. So we saw that you picked projects of things you'd already selected. Um, we are wondering how you find projects to join in the first place. Very good. So up here, when you're on your observations, this is your projects. So this is where you can go to look at the projects you have listed. If you go up here to community um, and click on this arrow here, you get a lot of options and one of them is projects. And you can go through then and search projects um, and find projects that are uh, certain subjects. Like if you're interested in projects about reptiles or wildflowers or fungus, if you're interested in projects that are specific to a certain area, um, you can start your own project if it's something you want to learn about. You want to, you know, see what the data on uh, iNaturalist is showing. Um, so you've got all these things. Um, I think at the very end, assuming I have time, um, you know, and if anybody needs to bail out early, please do. Or if I go over nine o'clock and you need to go, please don't, you know, wait for me. I'm not going to take it personally. But at the very end, I wanted to um, break out of the PowerPoint uh, and show a thing or two about exploring uh, areas on uh, iNaturalist. And I'll pop up to the community tab and show you where the project uh, button is so you can search for those when you're when you're ready to. Oh, good question. Thank you. Um, so from here. All right, there's my um, so now if I clicked on um, the picture right here, if you click on the name, I think it actually takes you to a species page where they just link to the usually just link to the Wikipedia article about them, but they'll have a, a map 
a global map of all the observations they have of hummingbird clearing. But if you click on that picture here, it will take you to your observation uh, and there's all your there's all your information. Again, the map when you uh, observed it, when you submitted the observation, your picture. If you have more than one picture, you can click on the icons here and it'll scroll you through. Uh, I believe it, uh, you know, if you click on this, it'll get bigger and then there's arrows on either side so you can scroll through the, the windows as well. Uh, and then if you scroll down, I can't do that here, but if you could scroll down this direction below annotations is projects and you can see here's the one I added to um, City Nature Month, which is going on right now. This was added to because it's in this month of April and it's in the DC metro area. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, and then Biodiversity and Gulf Branch and Glee Park, which I mentioned already autofills, so I didn't need to add to it. Another nice thing is, you know, they have top identifiers of this species. Um, if you don't get somebody to corroborate your ID after a while, you could message one of these other um, INAT users and say like, hey, I see that you've identified this a lot. I put this up as a hummingbird clearwing. Is it actually one of those moths or not? Um, so it's a way to connect to people that have identified like 825 mm -hmm. times they've identified a, you know, a hummingbird clearwing. Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Um, so <laughs> I, I'm not going to go over this page really um, at all. I just want to show you this is the infographic they have for making an observation on your iPhone. Um, I will say this, and here's the Android. Um, I will say this. These are I checked these because I've had this on my PowerPoint for a couple of years. I've been doing this, and they haven't changed much. Um, I will say, um, I don't spot something out in the wild. Open up iNaturalist allow it to use my camera and then take the picture through the app and do that all in real time that and, and again you can do that by all means that's not my style i take as many pictures as i can because i've got a fear i'm going to miss something while i'm taking a picture and entering it so i take my picture and i move and i take a picture and i move and then later on i'll come back and do this um it will ask you though if you're going to use pictures obviously it's going to ask you that it can use your camera it's going to ask for permission to use your camera and you're going to have to say yes um, to pull the camera up, but once you pull up, you'll you know you go through your select your photo, and you can upload it. One of the things that really frustrates me is you used to be able to do multiple pictures up to four because that was the rule on iPhone, and their last update they took that away. So you have to enter, you pick a picture, and you have to go back through your phone, scroll all the way up to the next picture, and enter that, and keep doing that with this plus sign here. Um, and I talked with somebody from my naturalist, and I know they're working on that, and they recognize it's a frustration. But it was um, camera was a security issue or what it was. But in order to upgrade the app, they had to take that away and they're working to get that back. Um, but yeah, so th again, you can do this. I, I, I don't ever do this in the field. It's something I do um, when I'm at home later on. But I, what I recommend is um, once, you, once you're going to, you know, you decide, hey, this is something I really want to do, you know, take a couple pictures. You might already have pictures on your phone. You know, if you're this interested, you probably do have a couple of critter, you know, critter pictures or plant pictures already. Um, and, you know, just go through these steps and see how that works for you. Um, what I wanted to move on to was pictures. Um, your picture doesn't have to look, and I'm not saying, this is one of my favorite pictures that I've taken. It's a 12 spotted skimmer from, I think it's in Massachusetts. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures. I, I, I think I did a good job with field marks and such, and so you can see everything that's there. I, I'm really pleased with the picture. Um, I know it's not going to grace the cover of a magazine. Your picture doesn't have to either. All your picture has to do is have enough information on it, enough field marks, enough shape, size, color, whatever it is to get somebody in the right place. Um, I put some pictures up on iNaturalist where I'm like, I can't believe I'm about to submit this. But I thought there was enough on that picture for somebody to, to make an identification. And some of the ones I put up where I'm like, no one's gonna give me an ID. I've been surprised to get one. So, you know, and people can use other things too. When The reason you put up when and where is for context. Because I've also uh, added an identification for something and they're like, yeah, no, that insect's on African, the African continent. It's not in North America. Um, and so again, your location is, is pretty important. Oh, before I move on, speaking of location, because I forgot this earlier, I take a lot of pictures around my home. I obscure them all. You can do, there's three different settings for a picture you can choose when you upload it. 
there's um oh boy i don't even remember what they're called i'd have to um i have to look it up but there's completely private i think it's private obscured and i, I don't know if it's open um or the three but one is just like yeah we're, you everybody can see where you took this picture however closely you've put it on the map the middle one is obscured where it's in a bounding box and that area where he took it's in that box but it really obscures it and then the third one is private and nobody can see that information and what happens is if nobody can see that information it does make it difficult for somebody to give an id depending on on how how good or not so good your photo is so keep that in mind um the other place i take a lot of um, pictures is on uh, my in-laws have property up north on along a river. I take a lot of pictures there and they're all in a bounding box too because they don't need people to know exactly where that is because I just don't think my in-laws would want people traipsing around looking for a bird or whatever. Um, but I want people to know the rough area where that is so I can still get an, an identification. Ken, um, is there other reasons other than your personal privacy that you might want to use? the obscure yeah. the other things such as you breeding spots nesting birds especially things like owls you you know if you've ever been in, around birders they're so if someone finds an owl breeding they can be very jealous and guarding that information because they don't want the owl to be disturbed and they don't want the nest to fail um so it can be you know uh breeding denning sites it can also be um uh very rare flowers which obviously can't run away from you and you know, they want people trampling all around to, to get pictures of it. So there are um, a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, and if and you might get a message from somebody on iNatural saying, hey, um, maybe you should make this, you know, obscure this or make this private. Um, and that's a good re that's a good thing to do. And sometimes you can, you know, wait a couple months and then open it back up so you can get it counted in whatever project or, or numbers you want. Um, but sometimes, you know, the birds reuse, for example, the birds reuse a nesting spot where the plants will grow there every year. So you may not want to uh, ever reveal that, but you can still get that critter on your list. Microsoft Teams. And okay. these two machines say, uh, yeah, it's we can't install that. And this one says go to Skype. Is there somebody that could mute their um, microphone because oh. I'm hearing a conversation? That's okay. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. Um, sorry. So back to the picture. So again, sometimes you take a picture, you're really pleased, you put up, you're like, this is the, you know, this is good. I, I should get an ID at the very least. Even a great picture, again, I'm trying to be humble here, but even a really good picture might not get you to the species level. This is a, uh, a moth. Uh, and there's a it's one's called the crocus geometer. Oh, I can't remember what the other one is, but it's something crocus <laughs> geometer. And the only way to tell them apart is by dissecting their genitals. Uh, and I'm not being crude. That's that's what you do. Everything I've read has said that except for one moth guy, the Peterson guy didn't um, I think it's northeastern moths. And. I don't think that's true because everything I've read online, especially on uh, some moth sites and on bug guides, says you have to essentially do a dissection in order to find out which species it is. Um, so, and I'm perfectly happy. This was I was really happy with the picture, and, and it was cool to see the moth. And so it's a xanthotype, xanthotype or xanthotypi. I'm not sure how I should pronounce that Latin. Uh, and that's the genus, and that's the farthest it's going to go because um, I'm not going to also, you know, destroy a moth so I can get an ID for my list. Um, this is. Uh, a crow and uh, I don't know how many people know we have two kinds of crows around here fish crow and American crow um, and I've had birders tell me they can tell the difference of the birds by size I don't subscribe to that you've got to hear them call these guys were busy eating trash out of a garbage can at an intersection I didn't have time to wait for the call so I got a picture of a crow I like the picture but that's all I've got it's 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 a crow and I won't be able to get species from that so you know manage your expectations not every photo is going to get you what you want on the other hand some bad photos might get you still get you that identification um this was the closest i could get with my zoom lens but i was able to get the bird i was trying to take a picture of whoops this blue gross beak right here and again um you know, I put you can put a circle around like a, a lot of times there's some very simple editing tools you can use to make sure you highlight in your photo what you want people to see. Because someone might be like, is he want the bird or whoops, does he want the bird or does he want the tree? Well, I come on, I want the bird. Um, the other thing you can do is you can crop and edit that picture so it's much larger. Um, 
and they can get it. It's fuzzy. Again, you know, not a magazine cover. But you can see the orange bars on the wings. You can see the really stout bill, the dark around the eyes, and this really, you know, dark blue color. And it's, you know, um, a, a pretty good uh, piece of evidence that it is a, a blue gross beak. So this is still a, a successful picture um, for a piece of data on iNaturalist. Um, and then this guy here. Uh, I think most people would recognize quickly that's a red tail hawk because he's got a red tail. Um, and I, I always show this after that gross because I think I really should have cropped this picture better. But there's nothing else in the picture. Um, and this picture was enough to get me, as you can see, someone else to agree with me. There's a red tailed hawk. And I've got a research grade observation there. And it went into three projects. This was above the Nature Center and Birds of the World, which automatically gloms onto every bird. Um, observation that's out there. Uh, and then I added this to the Virginia Biodiversity Project. Um, sometimes I look at these and I'm like, I wonder if that project's still there, because I've actually seen projects that were pretty big disappear off of uh, iNaturalist. So, um, oh, and then the quality assessment, again, it's research grade. We didn't need to see that. Now here are three really not good pictures, um, but through the three pictures, and, and these are cropped too, you know, I wasn't this close to the bird and took that bad a picture. These are really far away and I really had to to crop in to zoom them. But you can see the spotted breast, the white on the wing. You can see the line through the eye and the, the reddish bill with the dark tip. Uh, and it's a spotted sandpiper. So even though it was three really not good pictures, it was one good piece of um, data. It still will get the point across, which is in Limestone Park in uh, Alabama, I saw a spotted sandpiper. And now it's a data point for somebody if they're looking for that. So again, um, you know, if it's not a horrible, it's not, you know, if it's not like a blob squatch, like this fuzzy thing where someone's like, that's a magical unicorn that shoots pizzas from its horn, um, you can get a pretty good data point out of there, uh, Birds of the World Limestone Park. Um, there is something to be said. And oh, again, the reason I got that, that good a data point is because I took multiple pictures. I was trying to get, you know, a good picture of the bird, but I got multiple pictures. So I was able to get different angles for an identification. Um, this is a common milkweed. As you can see here, I, I have two pictures. When you're taking a picture of a flower, um, it always helps. Whoops. It always helps if you can uh, get a picture of the um, plant as a whole. Certainly um, the shape of the leaves, if you can see the veins on the leaves, the um, the way the leaves sprout here. Rachel, are you there? I am here. Yeah. What, we, we can see if it's opposite or alternate. Um, so this I'm, one is opposite. But yes. That is a really important characteristic to record when we're looking at plants. So taking a single picture of a leaf or a single picture of the flower um, is it's really vital to get uh, the opposite or um, alternate you know, leaf or branching on a plant. Yeah, thank you. I, I was struggling to remember that. And the other okay. key with that, too, <laughs> the other key with that too is depending on how deep your focus is, if you focus on the the flower, you might, it might fuzz out because the focus is just on the flower. It might fuzz out the rest of the plant. So again, multiple pictures can really help get an identification. They can help somebody else identify what you're looking at and that and that's really important is if you're when you're putting this up and you're trying to get somebody else to help you know agree with your identification or give you an identification because you don't know what it is the more information you can give them the better um sometimes you can you know frame your photo so you only need one you always know, i do talk about um how it's really helpful if you can get a picture of the bark of the tree the leaves the formation of the branches, the whole shape of the tree, which, you know, in the forest can be tough, but you know, the more pictures of a tree you can get, the better. Um, on this one, you can see the shape of the leaves and the venation here, uh, the um, the way the veins are um, uh, patterned on the leaf, and you can see the bark of the tree, and you can see graffiti, so it's pretty, a uh, pretty good guess this is American Beach. So that was, you know, a, it accomplished with a single photo, but a lot of times you're not able to do that, and so getting multiple pictures um is helpful with this kind of uh with these with plants and, and um trees and the plant's not going to run away so exactly exactly thank you jen speaking of um things that jen and rachel can talk about um fungus are another one where if you can get multiple pictures you have a better chance of getting a uh, identification and again 
you know, this one's down to a genus. That's as good as it's going to get. I know I'm not going to eat this because that's a really bad genus. Um, but, you know, you've got a picture of the top, but when you can get a picture of the gills on the underside, we can get a picture of the, is it a stalk or a stem? Stalk? Yes. Um, you know, this this little this little formation helps as well. All this can help to um, somebody give you an identification. And again, you you may not get past, you know, family or genus sometimes with these, and you have to be okay with that because you're still learning. You still know what group it is, and, and that's, uh, I think, part of it. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just somebody was wondering if you ever used seek, which I guess is uh, you may know what this is more than I do. I think you use a lot more apps. Um, seek, seek is from you could put information from Seek automatically into iNaturalist. I have Seek automatically lists into iNaturalist. It does. Does it? No, they're asking if it does. Oh, they're asking. I don't know. I've actually never used Seek. My impression is that it doesn't that it's more just a quick and dirty way to get an um identification and it's with all, without all the rigmarole of you know having an account and doing all that i i honestly don't know if you can leak a link seek to iNaturalist or to an iNaturalist account um i would have to check in with that um and get back to you uh, which i'd be happy to do because i kind of wanted to try seek but i haven't um, used it yet um whoever uh, asked that question if you can uh email me later or offline just send me an email i'll be happy to that'll help me remember and i'll be happy to check on that and, and get back to you with that information um this is so i i will get tired of doing some and i will take five minutes and go on iNaturalist and click on identify and just scroll through pictures and look for what people have put up and and you know add identifications and some like there's a cardinal and robin those are really quick and some other ones i know um and I, I love doing that but for some reason i have a peeve when i'll see a picture like this and someone's like bird or even better they'll just say unknown i don't know which one they are so if you if you want help on on you know a picture like this please be sure to identify to the group or to you know the users on naturalist which bird you're interested in um because i did the math for you guys so you don't have to there's 86 birds in this photo and there's four different species um there might be more but i know for sure there's four species in here um and the bird that i actually wanted from this picture is mm -hmm. this little guy right here because as lousy a picture as this is you can see the yellow eye. You can see the light tip of the dark bill. And this is an American uh, or this is a common golden eye. Um, and that's the, the one I want out of there. But if I'm just. Putting this picture up, no one's going to be able to help me get to that point because they don't even know which bird uh, I'm looking for. Um, even worse, sometimes I'll see something like this and someone writes mallard and there's not there there's actually a little green head there but there's not a mallard in sight and again i don't know what they are so if you have a crowded picture you know try to edit it and put a circle in it. it's really easy i don't have an android uh, i assume androids have this ability too but i know with the pictures on my iphone i can just um, go in and edit and add a circle around uh, the part of the photo i'm trying to get an identification for so again if you're asking people to help you with this do make it easy for them so um, I did take another picture of this raft of birds um, and I will show you what I did is what I what I did was of all these birds here. I was trying to get a record for iNaturalist. I decided to use this spot because there's a little more space here. and It was easy to single out the birds I wanted to ID from this group. So these are the birds I edited and cropped the photo down and then I put I duplicated the photo twice with circles. So this was the Brants which are relatives of the Canada geese, and these were the greater scops. And those are, from one picture, I've got two observations. Um, you can, there we go. You could just put this up and be like, the three birds in the upper right, uh, in because you have the option to, to put stuff in the description. I don't know that, that how helpful that always is, oh, but you can certainly do that. Um, and there is an option like once you if you just use this picture and put it up and you're like the three birds in the upper right and they're brand and then you could go up into in the record and duplicate the record uh and it would have all the information on there and then you could just be like the other three six nine twelve the other third 12 13 birds 
that aren't the Brants are Greater Scott. Um, but when you can do, whoops, come on. My cursor buttons aren't working, so I apologize. I'm just using my mouse right now because I can't figure out why my cursors aren't working. But when you can do this, it's really obvious um, to whoever's looking at your identification, your right. observation, what you want to identify. Does everybody hear that? Does anybody hear a noise right there? No. No. Nope. Okay, great. Uh, well, it came through on my computer, but what I had there was a recording of a New Jersey chorus frog. This is uh, out in Delaware. Um, I don't have a fancy equipment with a, you know, a big dish and earphones and all that. I have a small iPhone with a voice recording or voice memo function, and I use that um, uh, to make recordings. There is... Um, a sound editing app that's free called Audacity that you could use to um, edit your sound if you want, if you're that interested. Um, I pretty much just take a recording, hope it's good enough when I listen to it the second time, uh, and then I email it to myself off my iPhone and then take it off my email and then upload it this way. You used to have to do it through SoundCloud, which was an extra step. Um, and you can see here, this is older. You can, I did this one through SoundCloud, but thankfully you don't have to do that anymore. Um, so if you're that interested, um, this is a good way to record uh, frogs and, um, you know, bird calls. And if you have a, you know, a house that's got foxes screaming at three o'clock in the morning uh, in the middle of winter, you can get that on recording, too. That's always a fun one. Uh, and then, you know, this is what your profile page will look like. It lists your observations, your species, how many identifications you've done. Um, I'm a lazy journal poster, apparently. You know, the number of lists you have, followers, who you can follow and who's following you. Um, and you can get this from up here. This, if you click on this, it gives you the op options to go through all this. And you can also get all those same options right across the top here. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, some of the projects um, and lead into um, to what you can look at uh, later this week. Oh, did someone mute for me again? Thank you. Um, so this is the biodiversity in Gulf Branch and, and uh, Glebe Road Park. Um, and we have, you know, so many observations and observations. It's it's interesting. The last 30 days with everybody home, uh, there has been a ton of observations. I think like 10 percent of the observations in Arlington County on iNaturalist are from the last 30 days or so. Um, and it might even be higher now. There's a lot going in there, which is which is really neat. Um, but there are. Um, these kind of projects for a lot of the parks in Arlington. Um, the only ones you have to actually add to would be Donaldson Run, Potomac Overlook, and Long Branch Glen Carlin. And I'm working on getting those so that you don't have to do that either. Um, but here are uh, you know 10 biodiversity projects in parks around Arlington that you can add to that I do know staff look at to see what's, what's going on in there and see what the numbers are. Um, so this is a great way to add to um, what's being seen in Arlington. There's only so many people at the Nature Center. There's only so many staff for natural resources, but there are a lot more people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are walking through the parks every day, every week, every month, every year. And so being able to see what everybody else is seeing that they can add to that um, is really helpful and is a really nice snapshot of the parks that helps us know what's going on out there. Um, the City Nature Challenge. Um, this would be the, I can't remember if it's the fourth or fifth year. Um, it started out as a challenge between San Francisco and um, Los Angeles, I believe. And it's blossomed, the next year blossomed. It was like 60 cities around the U.S. And last year it was over 100 worldwide. And I, I want to feel like they had a couple hundred lined up this year. Um, so you can see from last year, we were fourth right here in the number of observers that participated, which is fantastic. Um, but you can see as a global event, there were 920,000 observations of 32,000 species. It's fantastic. Now, all the same, all people around the world over these four days getting out in the nature and, you know, recording what's there and, and not just experiencing nature, but also sharing it with other people. Um, we have our own page. So under the city nature challenge, there's all these challenges in these in these different areas. So here's the DC metro area. Um, you know, we had 30,000 observations 
uh, just within our area. And our area is big. This is what's considered the DC uh, metro area for this challenge, which is fantastic. Um, this year, it's a little different um, because obviously there's a lot of places under stay at home orders, uh, et cetera, because of the pandemic going, that's currently going on. So, uh, but they still want people to, you know, do whatever they can to still um, log in. If it's your backyard, if it's the, the vacant lot, if it's you're taking a walk or a run on the trail and you see something, you can take a picture without, you know, putting yourself or somebody else in um, a situation that's, you know, that you shouldn't be uh, because of the pandemic. You know, if you're not social, that's physically distancing. I don't like social distancing. We just need physical distance, not social. Um, but this is the uh, the City Nature Challenge overall uh, pro project, and then this is ours for 2020. Um, and that I did this earlier, but for us, it's going to start in about three hours and nine minutes. You know, midnight is when it starts, and it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then you can um, add observations through, I think, next Friday uh, is when it ends. You know, so you've got four days to record stuff and an additional five days to make sure everything is posted um, before the deadline. Uh, and again, like they said, they've really lightened up on the competition aspect of it because they recognize that you know people can't get out as much as they're, they, they're, they're used to, but they still want people to have this experience and do it. There's also City Nature Month. For the DC area that I don't have up here, um, but that's a project as well. Um, that's got a lot of, of, of observations from uh, the month of April and it runs again through April 30th, which would be next Thursday. What did I do? So, now? Ken, there's a question about that, yeah. um, okay. which is that um, if they do observations, will it automatically go into the month yes. project? Yes, because they've used that bounding box. Let me get back up there. They've used this bounding box. So if you put an observation that's in this area, it's automatically included in both the overall City Nature Challenge and DC Metro Area um, subsection of the City Nature Challenge. So I think if you remember earlier, I was showing you the projects I had. In 2017, they hadn't done that, so you had to add everything to both. Um, and they quickly realized that that extra step was yeah, I think annoying, but also kind of a barrier because not everybody remembered or knew to do that or remembered it every time. So now if you're within that bounding box, it's automatically added and that and that's great. So you just have to take the observations. They're automatically added into the projects. Uh, good question. Thank you. So we're supposed to be physically distancing. We're supposed to be staying indoors. We're supposed to be, you know, far away from people and, you know, obviously parks and, and certain facilities are closed. So what are some ways you can contribute? to the City Nature Challenge while you're there. Um, so let's let's be honest with each other. We're gonna get real for a minute here. Um, there's a lot of critters that are already living with you. Um, <laughs> this is a fantastic project. You know, check it out and see some of the stuff that's there. Um, there's also a book called Never Home Alone uh, that uh, Rob Dunn, this is the what the cover of the book looks like here. It's a little mini version of it. Um, that's a really good book about, um, it's worldwide, it talks about not just eat things here, but also, you know, like in Europe and in other parts of the world. Uh, but it's a really good book about, you know, essentially the ecology of our homes, because we are not living in a um, hermetically sealed bubble, no matter how much we want to think we are. Um, so, you know, how much of this can you exploit? Um, how much of this can you exploit at your home? If you've got that pesky mouse and he's been there for a while and you've got to have a heart trap, that's a really easy observation there. Let's say you're going to Home Depot because you're going to do a little project for part of your weekend. You're not just going to do the City Nature Challenge. Keep your um, phone ready for those critters that come into the garden section. Um, if we're being honest with each other again, if you have a home and it doesn't have a spider in it somewhere, you deserve a medal. Um, <laughs> because I haven't lived anywhere that hasn't had some kind of bug in it at some point. Uh, but just about every indoor area has a spider, either just on the outside or on the inside somewhere um, that you you know you could get an observation out of. Um, if you need uh, if you need a spider, I, I can lend you some. <laughs> <laughs> just let uh, me know. <laughs> um, but if it's in a cage, you might have to mark it as captive. So there's that too. Um, we all know we have a part of our house that needs clean, whether it's a attic or a basement, you know, you know, maybe you could do a little spring cleaning this weekend, have your camera with you so you can get some of these critters. Um, 
And last but not least, maybe there's that closet you need to clean out somewhere. Mm. This, yeah, this is the animal care <laughs> closet at uh, at Gulf Branch. And this, oh, I don't know where this little guy came from. To, to be fair, we had a four foot rat snake in here once too. I didn't include him because I really didn't want to um, give anybody the heebie jeebies. Um, you also want to check, and this is something that I had to do. I did the first year and it, and it, and it helped me you know, really get more observation, but really open my eyes. Um, check your own personal biases, biases, however you say that. Um, if you've never heard of it, plant by blindness is, is one of these cognitive biases where um, there's a tendency to ignore plant species because you're out and you want to see birds or you want to see mammals, or you want to see reptiles, you want to see bugs, and you're ignoring the plant that they're on. If you take a if you take a picture of a pollinator in a flower, you've actually got two observations there. You've got the pollinator and you've got the flower. You can't have two species in one observation, so you're always going to need to do you know you can do multiple uh, observations off the same picture um but don't forget that plants are important for this here is oops i'm trying to use my cursor key again here are seven flowers these are all from a mode area of the park and by mode area i mean essentially looks like grassland these are all tiny little plants they're all different species um and they're all, you know, observation points you can get in there. Didn't have to go very far. What I always like to tell people is, you know, small is sometimes not something that people pay attention to. If you've got a hoop or a rope or string, go out in the, you, into an area of your, your yard or in an area of a uh, you know, vacant lot, a field, you know, somewhere you're exercising, just stop for a second, put the hoop down and just examine what's in that hoop. And you'll be surprised how much you could get out of that one little space. Um, this is a great camp thing sometimes with kids when you're, you know, you know, got a little extra time, you know, what can you find in that when you really take a look at it? Um, I have a, uh, I'll show you at the end, but I have a little rubber band kind of magnifier I put on my phone that I can take magnified pictures of. You could probably use a hand lens, you know, or a small magnifying glass that maybe you use to help read or look at certain things, um, and get, you know, pictures that way of, of really small stuff as well. And oh, you might already be attracting animals to your yard. Make sure you fill up your feeders this weekend. You know, if you've got a backyard, if you've got an area where animals come, and if you want to get really fancy. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody okay? <laughs> uh, if you want to get really fancy, um, I will be putting up a black light in my backyard some point this weekend when it's not raining to see if I can attract any bugs on a, on a sheet. Um, you can see here that the black light's actually on the ground there. Uh, this is a bigger light uh, as well. So I tried two different things. But, you know, if you've got a porch light or a security light, you know, see who's attracted to it. Keep it on a little extra at night. Um, these are all ways to get uh, more critters showing up um, uh, around your place. So just little things like that that you can use to attract them. Um, just being active and looking at nature you're going to find things when you're really you're going to find more things when you're actually looking to um discover things to add to your um uh, to your observation list and uh, hopefully everybody got to read that uh, i always finish with this like i said i want to do uh one thing really quick live on iNatural, so hang with me for a second um this is a turtle i took a picture of in Akahuan National Wildlife Refuge down in Woodbridge. And I was like, hey, mud turtle. All right, eastern mud turtle. Cool. I put it up. And I had a guy who does turtle research come back to me and say, the stripes on here that go through um, the eye actually make this, a, I think, a striped mud turtle. And it was the northernmost record they've seen of this. Uh, and nobody would have known if I hadn't taken that picture of it. Now, eventually, maybe somebody would have taken a picture, obviously, or they'd gotten a close one. So this was a, a really cool thing, and they were really excited about it. Um, I don't know how many people on this uh, chat know David Howell, who has been uh, taking lots of pictures around Arlington to take, you know, to try to capture the biodiversity. He took a picture of um, what I, I think he thought was just a um, uh, an eastern pond hawk uh, down along Four Mile Run. Uh, and after trying to ID it out, thought it didn't look quite right. So he put it up on a naturalist and it turned out to I think it was a great pond hawk. Uh, and this was easily the furthest north one of those had ever been recorded 
um, in North America. So that was really nice. He got a lot of people commenting and looking at it that and helping with the identification to confirm it. No, a lot of people really excited about that that sighting. So you know you can you can stumble on these things sometimes. You find some really neat stuff. Um, so that is a naturalist. Some of the unnaturalists here. Um, All right, so it is not, let's see here. Does everybody see me now? No, um, no your presentation is still up. We can see you in the bottom corner, but if you stop sharing, you should pop back up. Let's do that. And then can I have, um, while you're navigating to um, the live view of iNaturalist, we do have okay. a question that you can maybe address when you're in there, which is, um, let me scroll up to it which was how do you see someone's comments on your photo? Um, like if somebody disagrees with your observation or gives a suggestion. So maybe you've posted an unknown picture. Where do you see people's comments? OK, um, OK, um, let me show you that. Let's we're going to I'm going to take over again. Uh, and I'm going to show you. Let's go screen them. This up. So here is hopefully everybody can see iNaturalist now. Um, this is where I pulled a picture from my presentation earlier. So, um, a lot of feedback there from, uh, thank you. Um, on the upper right here. There we go. Um, somebody needs to be there. There we go. Um, so here are. Uh, this is a really good one. This is somebody else's. Um, but here is, is is an observation. If you scroll down under the observation, whoops, not yet, not yet, not yet. Thanks, iNaturalist. So here's your picture and all that information. Right below it is the activity. And this is where people will suggest IDs. Um, I looked at this and I thought it was a horn passless beetle. And nobody else liked that. So I eventually withdrew the ID, which you can do um, through here. But you can see that the the person who posted it started with a uh, stag beetle ID and people thought it was a different kind of beetle and I don't want to overdo the beetle thing but I want to show you there was a lot of comment he put in two usernames to tag them essentially in the message to get them to look at it uh, and they decided it was a different kind of beetle and then one person said thanks for including me so this is where all that activity is um, if it's your if it's your beetle uh, you know, if it's your observation or even if it's not, you can agree to one of these other observations to add to the comments there. So, and again, not all of them, them are like that. Here's a cardinal. So it was pretty straightforward. Everybody agreed that was a northern cardinal. You know, so there's not always ones that have a lot of discussion, but sometimes there are. And it can be fun because you'll learn a lot and you'll, you'll see what other people are actually looking for uh, for that. Um, one other thing I want to I want to say before I go to the the projects thing, which is why I wanted to show you this. Um, if you go to identify here, here, right here. So when somebody puts unknown, that's okay if you don't want to take a guess. Um, but for like right here, okay, this is a sea turtle. At the very least, add an identification that says turtles and tortoises. Get it somewhere close. So if somebody's going through here looking at ID, you're like, you know, I'm going to look at turtles today. They're never going to get to that because it was unknown. So just by adding this, I've narrowed down this uh, identification for someone. Now, I don't know if J.E. Gomez 39 will be happy that that was the first ID, but it's going to get to the right place. Uh, it's going to get somebody else to the right place, especially something like this where you've got a grass. I think that's a grass or you've got this flowering shrub or, or bush or, or tree or I guess they're looking for this worm, you know, at least um, trying to get it to a smaller group or trying to narrow it down will help somebody who goes in here and they're like, you know, today I'm just going to look at these groups. They're never going to find that if you don't um, if you don't have something there. And sometimes from just these little things, if you want to help identify, that's a monarch. You know, you can agree quickly or you could open it up to see more information. Um, but what I really want to do from here um, is go to community and the second one down is projects. Somebody was asking about um, how you find projects. Here's where you can find projects. You can search um, whatever works. OK, that's interesting. Um, oh, these are I was searching for pictures from my, from my program. 
you could search for whatever project. Maybe you want to search for projects that have are about snakes. Click go. And here are medically important venomous snakes, all kinds of different uh, projects that you may or may not be interested in. Maybe you want to know about the snakes of Ontario, Canada, or you want to know about the snakes of South Central Virginia, which is a little closer. Um, so there's all these different things. Um, I'm not always certain how good this search function is for finding certain things, but if you're persistent and really specific, you can um, find things that you're looking for there. So that's one way to search projects. Um, one of the other things I said in my my blurb about this was, you know, you can take uh, snapshots and look at wildlife in other areas. Um, one of my favorite things to do with the city nature challenge last year was to see what other people were putting up just to get an idea of what was what was there. So like, let me see if I can. Yeah, here we go. Two years ago, somebody was nice enough to go out and make 36 whole observations um, in there. What you can do is go to species and click on that and you will get to see some of the um, species that they were seeing down there. And if you click observations, you'll see their actual pictures. These are what I mentioned earlier. These are casual observations. There's no photo. There's no sound. So somebody can't, um, what you call it, somebody can't confirm it. Um, if they had had, yeah, there we go. Here's a few. You can see it's a little cold down there, but somebody did go out, get a couple elephant seals, a snowy sheath bill, which I'd never heard of, uh, a Gen 2 penguin. So you can see um, what's being seen uh, in other places through these snapshots of these different projects around the world. Or you could just go to explore and you could pick, um, this one's for you, Jen. You could pick a place like Guatemala. Uh, and here's Guatemala, and there are 15,800 observations. If you click on species, you can see the different kinds of critters that they're that are, they're seeing there, and you can see they're very different uh, flora and fauna from what we're used to seeing. Um, also, to me, the fact that so many of these are birds will tell you exactly who's taking a lot of these pictures. These are probably people on bird trips. That there's a real high. Uh, percentage of birds up here instead of plants because plants are obviously as Jen mentioned earlier don't run away from you so they tend to really fill up um, uh, these uh, these species cues so Ken um, can yeah. you search for a project just by the area I think so I, again I'm not always sure how this function works um, give me an area to search like if you said Arlington like we know we had 10 parks earlier that had projects going on in them. If we just search Arlington, will we see all the projects listed? I think this is Luca's project here. The problem is, is <laughs> not in the title. Sometimes I think the, the problem with the search thing is you've really got to know the um, title of the project. Title of the project, yeah. So okay. um, let me try that again. I don't and, know. And can you maybe touch on how you see other people's observations? Like you mentioned Luca. Um, and how you can see people and the number of observations that they've had and, and things like that. Yep. So you can go up to community and click on people and you can search people. Um, if you know somebody that's on here. Or Tolman. <laughs> oh. No, I think, I don't know what my account <laughs> name is under. Well, that's embarrassing. You could. Um, uh, I do have an account. You don't? I do, but oh, yeah. I, I must exactly. have it listed under Rachel, maybe. Uh, here's Alonzo, our natural resource manager. You know, um, so you could search people this way, um, and then you can choose to. So here's uh, Alonzo's um, little avatar. Here's a uh, he did a, a quick little bio for himself. Some people have like paragraphs up there. Some people you'll just see it says so and so is a naturalist because they didn't add anything to it. You know, feel free to do as much or as little as you want. Um, you know, here's his observation species, all these kinds of numbers. Um, and then you can choose to follow. I'm already following Alonzo, so you can actually choose to stop following. But if you're following somebody in your dashboard, come back here, it will show when people comment on your observations. It will show, uh, I'm sorry, when people add an identification, when they comment on your observation, or on somebody else's, 
this the reason this observation is showing up is because I added an ID. So now I get information about when that is. And then if you're following somebody, I've asked for um, notices when stuff gets posted from Ar Arlington. So here's new Arlington observations. And then trying to find. Oh, no. There we go. Uh, and this is um, somebody I follow because I always like to see what Luke is finding because he finds great stuff. And um, I will get a notification in my dashboard that Luca has added nine new observations. So this is so when you follow somebody, this is what happens. It just like um, I, I can't remember if Luca's following me or not, but if Luca's following me and I put up, you know, seven new observations, he'll get that in his dashboard as well. Uh, and then you can also message people as well. Up here, people will send you messages and I've got messages from random people about different things. Um, because I posted somewhere or something. They're like, hey, could, could you um, you want to join our group about Colorado stuff? And they're like, I moved there from there 10 years ago, so you're not going to get a lot out of me anymore, but sure. Um, so and again, this is a social they're trying to just, they're trying to do a lot of social things. Here's a forum of different information. So, you know, if you know, if you're looking across this at some point, you're like, hey, my iNaturalist app crashes when I use the explore function too. Um, you know, there are people, you know, you can do bug reports and you can see what other people have been doing. This is how I found out that the reason I was losing space on my iPhone was because the uh, iNaturalist was taking up a huge amount because I was putting so many observations on. Um, and I wasn't sure how to get rid of the cache. But what I found was if I uh, deleted iNaturalist off my iPhone and then reinstalled it, I didn't lose any of the information, but I did lose um that huge hunk of memory it was using up and so i was able to free up a lot really quick when i um, did that on my iphone so you know if you use your iphone to upload things keep an eye on that because it will um you know it will add up after this point and you can just again remove it from your phone and reinstall it which takes you know a couple minutes at the most and, but then you also have uh what you call it um uh but then you get more space on your phone. So any other questions? I'm uh, a little over time here. I think Ken, yeah, if you're nearly done, we can take questions for anyone yeah. has questions. You're welcome to put them in the meeting chat or unmute your mic and and ask. I have a question. Um, so is there a way to not just capture an area, but to capture all like cricket and Katie did observations made in the month of August versus the ones made in Arlington? Like, can you, instead of drawing a box, can you draw a box around a group of animals? So let's explore. Or a time frame, I guess, Jen, if you're. Yeah, like, or like within this time period, or like, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the Cricket and Katie did census that we do in August. Okay. So we're going to look in Arlington, Virginia. So here's Arlington. We're going to look at. Did I not spell that right? No. Oh, you know what? It's probably not going to. What's um, that might be tough, Jen? Oh, let's see. Let's see. Um, you can look for, like, I could look for all reptiles in Arlington County. Here's all the observations of reptiles in Arlington County. Um, and you can also do a, rate, a date range. So let's, let's get rid of that for a minute. And then we could do a range, and let's say we wanted, you said August. Oops. Let's look at last year. So you can change this to August 2019 first. And then we're going to, I always hate when you have to change it again. 30th. What's that? Just August 30th. If that's easier. Yeah. So, and then unfortunately, I can't do any more than this, but I can at least narrow it down to here. Okay. Can you narrow this it down is, to I, this is a little tougher, but. So right. now can you these just are do insects or no? You can't narrow. I could do insects. insects, but I could also do um I could go by genus. So I can look up all the angle wigged Katie dids. 
And there were two, Jen. Two. Okay. <laughs> um, do you I'm remember just... what the scientific name for the common true is? Uh, something like leaf looking like terophilia. Terra... Terra... Nobody recorded terophilia in that same time. Okay. Yeah. So um oh what was the what was the what was the cricket? Gryllis something, right? I don't think that's um I don't think that's the one that they're checking for. But yeah, you could check crickets. Oh yeah, fall field cricket. I'm sorry, you're right. Yep. There's three fall field crickets. Okay. So yeah, so sometimes that might not be helpful. You know, and again, it all depends too on you know the buy-in of, of people in the area and, and, and what they're they're doing. Um, I will say, I have discovered a, an interesting bird in the area and went running after it before because of iNaturalist. There was a little blue heron at Huntley Meadows that I discovered in through the identify section one weekend. I was like, they're seeing this at Huntley Meadows, and I went and looked for it too. Um, I have gone places. Um, I went to. Uh, Costa Rica, and I looked up, uh, and, he, and I just looked up, you know, Costa Rica, and I went to species and just started scrolling through the species to see what I might see, uh, and then started a wish list, which I didn't even get half of, you know, but it was just a way to say, hey, I'm, you know, here's where I'm going. What are the kinds of things I might see there, at least that people are re recording there? Um, and again, see the, you know, you got these all these critters, the first 10 here are all critters. I wonder if it's the same in Arlington. And see, out of the first 10 in Arlington, six of them are plants. Um, so it's just the difference between um, people that are here all the time taking pictures versus in Costa Rica, where probably the majority of the people re uh, recording what they're seeing there are um, ecotourists who are looking for something very different, you know, are looking at, uh, are looking for very specific critters. Um, these are the two biggies right here. I feel like um, as much as you see these, you see a lot of cardinal and gray squirrel pop up a lot. But this guy's really easy to spot. Too. It's interesting that the salamander's first. I like um, that it puts a little red box on invasive. What's that? I like oh, that yeah. it puts a little red invasive box. Yeah, so this is really cool. You can actually click on the observations and you could see um, all the different observations. You could click them as, a, as a, a grid to see all the different ones. But yeah, I do like that um, they pop up and it tells you that they're they're non-native. Actually, um, go back here. This was the uh, wandering broadhead planarian I showed you earlier. Now there's the picture, but it showed it right away on your, um, when it's on your observation page, you'll see this little pink um, oval with an exclamation mark, and that's how it lets you know that this is introduced. Arrived in the region via anthropogenic means. I love that. <laughs> um, cool, and again, there's a, there's a lot more that you could explore and do. You know, I, I tried not to, I didn't want to overwhelm anybody, especially anybody that's new to it. I think, it's a fabulous tool. I really enjoy iNaturalist. Um, you know, if anybody, for those of you that are still with me, thank you. If you have any questions, by all means, um, please feel free to email me at golfbranch at arlingtonva.us or krosenthal at arlingtonva.us or call. You know, can't stop by yet, but, you know, the other two work really well. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on iNaturalist or how to do something or anything that you're interested in, um, any kind of questions that you have about it. I think it's a really valuable tool. I think it's a great way to engage people uh, and get citizen science going. So, yeah. Are there any other questions? Mm, doesn't sound like it, but we'll give them a minute. But I'm, this is, again, so cool, so exciting, so many different ways to search and so much information to, uh, to look at and even even add to um, again having those annual like Jen was saying you know we, we can look at those crickets from 2016 2017 2018 2019 and get an idea of you know how things are looking um, 
and looking at where, you know, are invasives spreading? Are they shrinking? You know, how are we doing in those areas? Um, it's just a wealth of information. So we really appreciate, you know, anyone who's contributing, you know, any information that just adds so much to, to so many um, ways to look at it and for, for researchers and, and local people to use it, so. I guess there is actually one last question here. Uh, Janet, uh, if this is being recorded, how will we be able to, I'm sorry, if this is being recorded, will um, we be able to use it in the future? I guess, come back to this and, and use it to like figure something out, I'm not sure, but where will this recording be saved and will it be accessible? That is a good question that I need to figure out, but for anybody that was invited on the, that GIF is really distracting me, Rachel. I'm sorry. For, that's okay. It's great. For anybody <laughs> that um, is is on this recording, they should have access to it. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't explored it because this is the first one I've recorded. I know it's a cardinal sin to admit this is the first time you've done something, uh, but this was this was really fun to do, and I appreciate everybody helping out and keeping muted. It uh, worked out really well. Um, so, I will figure out how to. Yeah, check. so I think okay. after we close the meeting, um, the app that we're in takes a while to process it, um, okay. but it will eventually show up back in Teams, um, saying that it's available as a file. Um, I don't know that it's accessible by everybody who is in the meeting, but it's accessible to Ken who ran the meeting. Um, and so then, you know, potentially if it's again, okay with everybody else, we could potentially post that link up um, to other places where other people who couldn't participate tonight or things like that could, um, you know, view afterwards. Um, so again, that, that's still kind of new to us, but you know, this should again be processed and then available as, a type of file of exact kind. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, it's a little bit I know. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see how it comes out. All right. Cool. Thanks. Great. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Um, hopefully, we'll do something else like this soon. All right. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Bye.